next speaker this evening is Jimmy Clayton, and Jimmy is an economics and finance major, double major, and his project is entitled The Economic Impacts of Historic Tourism, and he worked with Dr. Peter Calcogno from the Department of Economics. So the key element to the research that I conducted over the past year was really all about historic preservation. Uh, and when we talk about historic preservation, a lot of the times people tend to refer to it as sort of a single institution or a single policy, when in fact it's more of a patchwork or a conglomerate of smaller individual policies that uh, you know, by themselves may not seem very impactful, but taken as a whole, they actually become a very significant economic event, if you will. They can range from things covering land use and zoning, building and construction pro uh, projects and the, the process of getting permits for those, uh, the things that homeowners can do their own property as it pertains to repairs and alterations to the property, as well as the development of commercial real estate and restrictions on what kind of businesses can set up shop in certain areas of the city or the county. Uh, and governments can enact these kinds of initiatives for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes they're just humanitarian, you know, it's preserving the culture and the history of the city for its own sake. But a lot of the times there is an economic reason behind all of that. For example, the most common example, like we see here in Charleston, uh, robust policies in historic preservation can foster the growth of the heritage tourism industry. And when we say heritage tourism, what that means is tourism, uh, you know, bringing people in for the sake of appreciating and recognizing the historic value in a certain area, uh, a landmark or a set of properties. Unfortunately, uh, while this can create jobs like many well-intended regulations on business and commerce, the economic effects can actually be contradictory down the line. Some examples being the creation of jobs in one tourism industry while restricting other types of businesses from growing and adding more jobs to the economy in other sectors, uh, as well as the additional appreciation of home value for homeowners in a historically designated area is great for the creation of wealth in a certain area, but Almost always it's accompanied by rising rent, which is tougher on middle and lower class families and workers and forces them to move farther and farther away from the historic area and can move farther in. So, so for the study I conducted, um, I compiled a list of 30 counties in the southeastern United States, 15 of which uh, are notable in sort of the common public preconception of having historic value and emphasis on historic preservation. And the other 15 are also in the southeast, but without that same common preconception of historic emphasis. Um, and we stuck to the southeastern United States because while there is historic preservation and heritage tourism to be found all across the country, the essence of what is drawing people in can be very different from different regions in the country. So we decided to hone in, um, obviously the study kind of started with an interest in historic preservation in Charleston. And those types of cities draw their historic value, if you will, to the tourism industry from sort of that colonial early American architecture uh, infrastructure and things like that. So we stayed there um, and we have those two, we have the focus group and the control group. And then from there, we just collected as much data and variables as we could, mainly from the Census Bureau, but also from the BEA, the College's own Office of Tourism Analysis uh, and the National Registry of Historic Places. So this is just a breakdown of the focus group and the control group that we have here. Um, if you look at the, the county seats for each of these counties, what I mean by a common preconception of historic emphasis becomes more clear. We're talking about Charleston versus Myrtle Beach, Savannah versus Metro Atlanta, um, St. Augustine versus Palm Beach, things like that. And we try to stay as much as we could in a narrow band of populations and land masses uh, for each of these counties to stay consistent, but with the rather strict geographic constraints we put in ourselves, um, that was tough at times. So if there were outliers, the obvious one being Fort Lauderdale over there with almost 2 million people in, in 2019, if there is going to be an outlier, we try to find a counterpart for it in the other group, Palm Beach in this case, with a million and a half. Um, over the course of the data collection period, we brought in over 50 variables. Uh, obviously, the vast majority of those don't make it in the final model, and I'm not going to list them all out for you right now, but they generally fall into six distinct categories. Income and wealth, uh, historic preservation and heritage tourism, education, commute and travel time, uh, poverty and unemployment, and hotel occupancy. So this is generally the model that we knew we wanted to have, or the framework for it at least, uh, an income or wealth variable sort of being a proxy for economic impact overall, with the other five categories of variable being the independent variables there. Uh, we started out with a very rough baseline model, and then over time, 
tried different combinations of variables, test different theories about why some variables are more significant than others, why significance changes as different variables are put into the model in combination with one another uh, to try and find a, a final model, if you will, with a high level significance. And so what we found was basically this framework here where a lot of these we can hold consistent. So our education variable is the proportion of people in county with a bachelor's degree. Our, our unemployment and poverty variable was just the average unemployment rate in that county for the years 2015 to 2019. The average daily rate uh, is the average rate that hotels would charge for uh, a nightly stay over that same period 2015 to 2019. Uh, this ratio here is the ratio of workers in a county that are traveling from outside the county in for their jobs versus those who live within the county they work. Uh, and then finally, heritage tourism significance, which is a binary variable, a one for if heritage tourism is a significant part of that county's economy and a zero if it's not. And what really went inside and what really brought the whole model together uh, was the commute time variable here. So these are expressed as the percentage of a county's population whose commute time falls in a certain range. So over there, we have 30 to 60 minutes. Over here, we have sub 30. And then finally, an interaction term, which is essentially multiplying the value of heritage tourism significance with the value of the proportion of a county's population that falls within that commute time range. So you think about it, if heritage tourism isn't significant to a certain county, that value can be zero. So no matter what, the value of the interaction term can be zero, whereas it's going to equal the value uh, of the commute time if you're multiplying it by one, if heritage tourism is significant to the county. Um, and what we found is that initially in the 30 to 60 minute travel zone, when you look at the, uh, the interaction term, generally what this tells us is that in areas as, uh, as the proportion of people that are traveling longer, 30 to 60 minutes to commute to their job in cities or counties where heritage tourism is important to the economy, uh, actually as the commute times get longer and the ratio of people that are traveling from outside the county in increases, median income goes up for the county. Whereas over here, if you look at uh, this model, the opposite is true. As you increase the proportion of people in the sub 30 commute time range or shorter relative commutes, that goes up. As it interacts with heritage tourism, um, the median income actually has a is detriment. Uh, move on to the next one. And these are just two more models um, that follow essentially the same pattern. We have the proportion of people traveling over an hour to get to their job and the, the mean travel time. And these just kind of reiterate the implications of the last two models where uh, as more people are traveling an hour to their job in cities where heritage tourism is important, median income actually goes up. And if you look at the coefficient, it goes up by an even larger magnitude than if they're you know, traveling for 60 minutes. And then for every minute that mean travel time goes up for a county where heritage tourism is important, median income goes up. So what does this all mean? Essentially, what we draw from these models uh, is that in counties that acknowledge heritage tourism to be a significant part of their economy, Yes, jobs are created, uh, median income rises, but also uh, people are tend to be forced farther out from the middle of the city, from the metropolitan area. So high commuting times in combination with significant heritage tourism generally lead to higher incomes. Um, and what that tells us is that uh, the jobs created there are valuable enough that if you're seeing higher commute times, it means that they're worth more money to come in. So that's why that's an indicator of that. Um, so. What does that mean in terms of the scope of the whole study? It doesn't tell us precisely or reliably whether or not heritage tourism has a net positive or negative impact. What we really found out is uh, the implications of heritage tourism in combination with it, the effect of it forcing people farther and farther out from the city. So further research that might be needed is a closer look at, like I said, that kind of conglomerate of all different policies that make up historic preservation, looking more into those as individual variables, like zoning laws, interactions with businesses in the city, uh, as well as taking in more quantitative data when it comes to determining the significance of tourism. Uh, we obviously conducted a study at the county level. There was a wealth of information, especially from the Census Bureau, that came at the county level. But really, when it came to uh, quantitative tourism, GDP and general GDP data, that more is available at the metropolitan statistical area. Those are larger geographic areas. And so the cutoff or the uh, determination of what counties uh, had heritage tourism as a significant part of their economy was more or less arbitrarily decided by me. It had to do with the emphasis placed on their tourism section of their website, where they had a section like uh, of their website dedicated to historic tourism, things like that. Whereas through this, we would be able to set up a hard and fast quantitative threshold for that. That would take my bias and my decision making out of it. So that's part of it. Uh, additionally, 
commuting ended up becoming a really important part of the study, but there's other cost of living effects that have to do with historic preservation, including rising rents, the cost of gas when it comes to commuting, uh, the inflation of certain consumer goods, especially food and beverage at restaurants, uh, as those as those industries grow, that we would have to determine in a separate model because uh, a lot of those are too highly correlated with variables that are already part of it. So that's where else uh, we would look for further study to kind of nail down a more specific, reliable net impact of historic tourism on, on a local economy. So finally, I want to uh, acknowledge Dr. Calcano. Um, I definitely wouldn't be able to complete this project without him. He helped take a very vague idea, take shape into a more specific study, and really point me in the right direction. Additionally, I wanted to acknowledge Dr. Chris Mothorpe from the Economics Department, Dr. Bromley McLeod from the Department of Hospitality and Tourism Management, and Melinda Patience from the Office of Tourism Analysis, who are all really pivotal in helping me collect my data, select it as well, and, and accurately interpret what it means. Um, any questions? Let's see or? here. So one question here, Jimmy, how might a major unexpected uh, in, impact like COVID potentially influence the results of your study? That's a great question. So um, had the study uh, encapsulated the past year, um, it would have just been an, an anomaly. I think most of the data I collected was from the American Community Survey from the Census Bureau, which is averaging out statistics over 2015-2019, so it was more of a smooth average. If it had incorporated 2020, it would have been a lot different, uh, especially as it pertains to unemployment, poverty, and median income. Um, so it, it probably would have, um, I can't say how it would relate to the, the implications of the study as it comes to heritage tourism, because I think um, for most of these counties across the board with the same type of tourism in their economies and being in the same region, they all would have been affected similarly. So I think it would have changed the uh, the way the data looked across the board, but I would like to think that in terms of what variables ended up being significant and what mattered more, I think things would have stayed roughly the same. Good question. I'll ask a question. If no one has a question in the audience. That was, that was really interesting. I have a, um, Question that's probably going to be like just your opinion, but I want you to base it on oh, as sure. much as you can on the model you've created. And I'm just thinking if you are giving advice to a city, a municipality, is there like a sweet spot with regards to historic tourism, you know, with, with regards to number of historic spots, um, those types of things that you were kind of taking into consideration um, for your for your model? Like, what would you kind of recommend? Um, so that's interesting you say that because uh, one of the variables I collected was the, the number of historic places and districts within a county, um, as well as whether or not the historic district and county was located at the county seat. And those ended up in all the combination I tried it to be as uh, statistically insignificant. Okay. So based on, based on this, I would think the sweet spot lies somewhat in terms of um, how far out the average person is traveling into work. I think there is a sweet spot there as it pertains to the ratio of people traveling outside the county versus those that live within the county that work. I think there's a sweet spot, but a lot of that is out of a municipal government's hands because they can't help a lot of that's dependent on the land mass of the county and things like that. So I think if you're going to invest in, in historic preservation for economic development, you have to sort of pair that with investment in maybe infrastructure to help facilitate the commutes and you sort of expand that range through which people can travel in and that sweet spot commute mm -hmm. time range. That's what I would say. That's a good answer. Um, I have another probably naive question, but um, so obviously the United States is a very new country, right? right. So um, how do you think it might be different if you look at data from like, you know, an area in Europe where it's like there's so much historical value everywhere you look and it's far more integrated um, into, you know, the everyday living of, of individuals over there. Would you think it would be different or? I would imagine that, well, I think it would have a similar impact on, uh, a, on a, like a tourism industry basis, mm -hmm. but you'd be looking more at international tourism, which is a little different. Um, but like you said, there's more of that historic value spread out. So I think in terms of especially commuting, how far people are willing to live outside a certain city to travel in, maybe you'd see less willingness to live far outside of the city, especially for jobs centered around the heritage tourism industry because there's a higher supply of jobs, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, but I think overall you would see fairly similar things. But like you said, it's and like like I said at the beginning, you know, we focus on the southeast because heritage tourism even itself is not a specific thing. You have to really focus on the essence of what's drawing people in. So I think it's a whole different 
kind of heritage tourism that you might see over there. And even within that, the different cultures and sort of the different things that would allure tourists. And um, I think you would see really a lot of fragmentation in terms of what's important where in different parts of the continent, if we're talking about Europe, for example. Yeah. All right, thanks. Anything else? 